So session number two is uh, more focused on the European dimension, how Europe responds to this crisis uh, and what could be done to respond better to this crisis and what kind of new security order might emerge in the European context from this. So I, uh, we've got a fantastic panel um, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming them on stage now. <laughs> on they come. Oh. Yes. Please. Right. <sighs> For a seating order. Yes, Anna, well, why don't you um, go to the, the far seat, Anna, and then Beatrice and Elizabeth? Yes. Fabian, I guess, if you come in. And then we'll leave. So uh, General Adrian Bradshaw is not here yet. He's being decorated, apparently, not with a icing sugar or something like that, but a Belgian medal. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to Adrian in a bit if he appears, General Bradshaw, I should say, probably. So uh, first on stage, Anna Fotiga, who was uh, a foreign minister of Poland and senior European politician who, uh, unsurprisingly, given her background, uh, has been keeping a close eye on the Russian threat uh, for many a year. Uh, then we've got Professor Beatrice Hauser, historian, political scientist, and uh, somebody who's worked in NATO, uh, looking at these, uh, and at uh, kings. Uh, well, uh, uh, so you've got the benefit of the home audience. Uh, Elizabeth Braw, uh, journalist and scholar specializing in deterrence. You were at RUSI, weren't you? You're now uh, at the American Enterprise Institute and has just flown in. So uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for coming in. Uh, and I should say, by origin, Swedish in case the uh, question turns to the, the Nordic flank of NATO or whatever, we, 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 can, we can get some expert, yes. exactly, expert opinion on that. And then finally, Dr. Fabian Zuleg, uh, Chief Executive and Chief Economist of the European Policy Centre in Brussels, specialist on EU and EU accession, but also, of course, from Germany and able to uh, look at that country and its obviously key importance in uh, defining what goes ahead. Well, let's kick off uh, with Anna Fotiga, because Anna, um, you know, I guess that if you're Polish, a lot of people will have been saying, particularly since 2008 in Georgia or 2014 in, uh, in Crimea and Donbass, look, this is a, a thing that needs to be urgently addressed and uh, with varying results among European countries. Some, I think, probably preferred uh, to ignore it. So do you think now there can be no further argument about this, or do you think there are still some European countries who don't understand the magnitude of this and, and the type of change that needs to happen? Well, allow me to start with uh, thanking uh, UK for, for this dance, for, for, for actually for many years already, and in particular, in, in recent times. I think it is uh, over political uh, uh, divisions in the country or all over po political opinions in this country. I think that in terms of uh, perceiving the threat, uh, uh, the, the imminent threat from a Russian Federation since since beginning of, of previous uh, year and and mounting of arms uh, around uh, Ukraine, five eyes. Uh, so so the old alliance uh, were right, uh, and and actually it was the most accurate uh, assessment of uh, the situation in. Um, Saying this, uh, I would, uh, well, I wonder, uh, because listening to previous panel, I put uh, the question, how to deal with the country uh, that is, uh, that, that develops like, like current Russian Federation, nurturing, uh, ages old uh, ideas, and it is not only Putin, because now this war 
in Ukraine is online, actually, and we see all effects of, of this war. So the neo-imperialism that, that is a legacy of older ideas, because for, for uh, ages, uh, being a Tsarist Russia, the Soviet Union, or the, the, the Russian Federation, modern Russian Federation, there is uh, enormous expansion accompanied by unbelievable atrocities. When we see what happens in Ukraine and, and try to remember Chechnya, I was uh, reminded about this. You know uh, how how they used to 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 get Grozny, and now send Kadyrov to to do same atrocities, exactly same atrocities. So extermination of those who are not not willing to assimilate is part of policy. And the question is, when we deliberate how to deal, how to build a strong security environment in such circumstances, the question is how to deal with a country nurturing old ideas, not, uh, not reforming uh, structures, because KGB uh, guy runs this country, and he is not alone. Russia is like mafia type country. Uh, the economy of Russia is fully, fully regulated by by colleagues of of uh, Putin, and these are links uh, with. Uh, with the West, collective West. Let's and this mafia has uh, nuclear war arms. Are Absolutely. we able to, to stop this Let's once and, and for, for eternity? It's or? a very good uh, moment to bring in Beatrice then in terms of, does Europe share that perception, those uh, things we've been hearing from Anna? It, I mean, because in the past, obviously, there were differing responses based on geography, economy, energy, uh, all the different interests, uh, variable geometry. Uh, can that survive? Uh, and is it inevitable that some countries will not feel that strongly? Or do you think this is a, a, a true paradigm shift? Remember St. Malo? Or uh, the Brussels let's, Treaty, let's, or modified Brussels Treaty? Let's bring in Beatrice. We were this. able to. To, to say, or the West, collective West, was able to say at that time that uh, military cooperation, close, between France and, and UK, possible. Yeah, that's possible, not only transatlantic uh, links, should be Anna. accompanied by economic links, and I believe it, I'm an economist by, by, in my background, it should be innovation cooperation. And so links are not sanctions, again, to be cut, are not right, sanctions. Anna, you've, you've, you've put your views over very clearly. Let's, let's get a, a perspective from Beatrice on that. One, sorry, of the things that no, one of the things that really surprises me is that we are no longer in an east-west ideological contest. Yeah. And nevertheless, we find that there are people in the West and throughout the West that seem to be influenced by the Russian story or that seem to buy into the Russian story. And I find that absolutely extraordinary. Also, there seems to be no proper lineup with particular ideologies. So you find in France, for example, both on the far right and on the far left, people who are very much in sympathy with Putin. How is mm. that possible? You know, I, that's something that really, really ast uh, astonishes me. And the other thing, you know, we have centers of excellent for uh, strategic communication, all this sort of thing. We seem to have absolutely no way of affecting public opinion within Russia. 
in the Russian hinterland. I mean, now we, we have ac uh, some access to um, academics and, and a very small elite in the Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, uh, cities. Uh, but the vast majority of the Russian uh, population seems to have absolutely no exposure to an alternative story on this, whereas throughout the West, there seem to be people who've got the exposure uh, to the Russian story and buy into it. And I find that absolutely flabbergasting. Elizabeth. Uh I know the you free, were looking a lot. The, free, the, free, the open society and its enemies. That's, yeah. uh, that's absolutely. what we experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and in yeah. terms of grey zone, I know, I know previously when we appeared on a, a platform, you were talking a lot about that. Uh, I mean, this is, or whatever you want to call it, red zone. I mean, this is, this is not about gray, shades of grey in terms of the scale of the aggression and the scale of the shock. Uh, <coughs> but does it shift relationships on meaningfully? Does it... Does it, does it provide the necessary impetus to come out with a more coherent European uh, response to, to threats from the East? Uh, it does, and I'm, I'm going to be rude, Mark, because I've been told to, to talk into the microphone, not look no, at no, you. No, no, please, so, please. So, it's very important no, for no back to hear you. No, um, no. So, Mark, I think that the challenge is that we are so well set up militarily, but, but um, the weak part is our civil society. There was a fantastic quote in, I think, uh, last week's New, uh, New Yorker, was a, uh, the reporter had gone, um, <clears throat> gone to Ukraine or was based in the Ukraine, uh, was based in Ukraine, and um, nice to see you, Ambassador. Um, and uh, he was, uh, happened to be at the gas station that was, uh, or petrol station that was manned by volunteers to, who made sure that people didn't get more, uh, more petrol than they were supposed to. And some, uh, a car pulled up with Lithuanian li license plates. And apparently that's something that, that it happens quite a bit in Ukraine. I'm not ex an expert on, on Ukrainian license plates, but apparently people do this. Uh, people register their cars elsewhere uh, to, to save money. And so this, this volunteer at the gas, at the, at the petrol station said, um, no petrol for people who don't support our state. And I thought that was, that was brilliant. And then he, he told this, this, uh, the people in this car, support our army, support our people, then you get your petrol. And that's what it's about, right? I mean, our responsibility as citizens to support our country. And, and if we don't have that, then what's, what's the point of having strong armed forces? If behind them, mm -hmm. in, in our civil society, we, we have this mush of people who, who uh, may, uh, may not have, uh, feel any allegiance to our, society, to our government, to our society more generally, and so are, are extremely receptive for what you, for example, just mentioned, Beatrice, and for other forms of, of aggression. And, and everybody admires Finland. Well, Finland has uh, spent decades educating the population about mm. national security threats. And, and as a result, they have 77% well, of, of, of the population willing to defend the country uh, uh, with weapons, them personally defending uh, the country with weapons, should they be asked to. But how do we get to that? We, I think it starts with uh, feeling a commitment to society. And I would, maybe this is an investigation for you, Mark. I would would love to see uh, a, a, an investigation into the connection between tax evasion and willingness to defend one's country. I, I promise you anything in Finland, they have low rates of tax evasion, but that's for you uh, investigative journalists. Thank you. Um, Fabian, uh, Germany, always so central to European debates, uh, and, and hearing Elizabeth talk about uh, attitudes there to defending the country, things like that, we know. Uh, and education, indeed, about national security threats. That, uh, that is not the case in Germany, and the numbers are much lower of people who say uh, they, they'd take a gun in their hand, as it were, to defend the country. Uh, how big a, a, a transformation do you think is necessary in terms of German attitudes? Because the Chancellor, in announcing uh, changes, uh, more defence spending, uh, changing energy priorities, suggested that he was going to lead the country uh, to a different place. Is that doable in the foreseeable future, do you think? Well, I think, firstly, um, I would say that Germany has already changed a lot uh, in the last weeks. Um, there have been many taboos which have been broken. Uh, we shouldn't forget that um, for a long time, Germany was told not to do these things. Um, mm. It was told that it could never engage again in any kind of military adventure. Yes, there was um, a change already over the last years, 
but it is still a major change, um, not only to policy, but also to the psyche of people. And there was a belief that um, Russia could be controlled through trade, through interdependence. Um, clearly, we now know that didn't work. Um, but this is a big change um, which has to come. Now, there are some people in Germany um, who um, traditionally have believed in uh, non-military means. So there is that peace movement which is saying that whatever has happened, um, the best way of addressing this uh, is through peaceful means. Um, but I think they are in the minority now. Um, so we are seeing much more willingness uh, to address this. We are seeing that German weapons are going um, to Ukraine, which is a major change. Um, that's not to say um, more um, doesn't need to happen. Clearly, there is more which has to happen. Uh, but I think overall, actually, Germany is in the r going in the right direction. And a big recapitalization of the Bundeswehr and the, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, things we've known for quite a long time, which have to happen. Um, uh, but not only that. I think uh, we have to look at the whole package, um, the sanctions, the energy sector, which is much more difficult for Germany and some uh, Eastern European countries than for others. Uh, we have to look at also uh, the response to the migration question. So it's the whole package. Um, and in all of those areas, a lot has changed, not only in Germany, but across the European Union. Thank you. Uh, we have now been joined by General Adrian Bradshaw, who, uh, like uh, General James Everard in the, in the first panel, is a former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander and therefore very much steeped in the alliance management issues uh, and, and questions of collective security. Uh, and so it's great to bring you in, General. Perhaps on this question, uh, one or two of the panelists more or less said, well, we're kind of there on the military uh, in terms of, of, of uh, European, I guess, spending or force structure, but do, do you feel that there is an effective uh, uh, European military capability? Uh, do you feel that NATO if essentially can serve all the requirements uh, of people in the European space? How, how do you see things developing in terms of concerting an improved collective response to what's happened in Ukraine? Thanks for that. There's quite a lot in that question. Yes, I'm sorry. But, um, Firstly, um, I think we all need our Titan vendor. Um, and uh, one is delighted to see the realization in Germany, which is not at all surprising, but I think collectively in Europe uh, and in the transatlantic domain, we need um, that realization. But I was reflecting this morning that um, Mr. Putin has committed two heinous crimes with respect to uh, Ukraine. Um, on the macro scale. One, of course, is embarking on this terrible war and unleashing this um, unacceptable aggression in the heart of Europe. But the other is um, in uh, managing to lie to his own nation to quite such an extent and to uh, get a nation to believe so many things which are fundamentally completely untrue. And listening to the uh, Radio 4 this morning, the interviews in Russia on the eve of their parade, mm. uh, one reflected with horror the degree to which Russian people have drunk the Kool-Aid, have, have got the message. And uh, so coming back to the point that has been made actually um, already on this panel, uh, we need to remind ourselves that warfare is hybrid <coughs> by nature. You know, we all started talking about hybrid after 2014. It's hybrid by nature. It's an all of nation, collectively, all of capability affair. It's not just about armed forces. It's about winning the information battle. It's about winning the economic battle. It's about uh, winning the war of ideas. And it was easy enough in the Cold War to have a great idea which was opposed to uh, a grim <coughs> ideology. Um, we need to generate the great idea about the importance of democracy and freedom and the rule of law and of truth and how important it is that that wins in the struggle with these autocracies, these criminal autocracies. And so um, what I would wish to see 
in our defense structures. Uh, firstly, is a, an acknowledgement across uh, NATO, particularly from uh, the nations who aspire to be in the lead of European defense, that the transatlantic nature of NATO is absolutely vital, um, that our link with the Americans is incredibly important, and that NATO is the organization for transatlantic military strategy making and for executing the military collective requirements of Europe and the North Atlantic area. The talk of European uh, strategic autonomy in defense should be quietly uh, reduced and more talk should be made of the nature of the relationship with the United States. And the EU and NATO need to start working together properly. We have the Berlin Plus arrangements, which have so far managed to command three operations since 2003, which is a lamentable state of affairs. They were very successful. The counter piracy operation, the operation uh, down in the south of the Balkans, and most importantly, uh, the U4 operation in Bosnia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina which is incredibly important for the stability of that part of the world. But it demonstrates that using NATO command structures, NATO facilities, Europe can execute military operations without duplicating military structures within the EU. What actually needs to happen is that NATO and the EU need to be able to formulate strategy together, which I might say is impossible. You would be amazed that during my time as Deputy Sacure, it was impossible to have strategists from the EU and NATO in the same room developing joint strategy despite the hybrid nature of warfare today. We could not coordinate military strategy and NATO economic strategy, NATO political strategy, NATO financial strategy because it was not allowed. Why? Because a couple of nations, one of which is a, a member of NATO but not of the EU, and another a member of the EU but not of NATO, <laughs> ban it. So 29, 30 nations can't do the business, mm. the vital business of today, which is coordinate grand strategy. So that's my observation for this morning. Fabulous. Sorry, Beatrice, you wanted to... Yes, to absolutely. Comment. There was a moment when I thought we were going to disagree, and I actually then found that we have total uh, lost lots of common ground there. Because one of the things that I've been uh, preaching all my lifetime in academia is that what we need is a European pillar of NATO along the Berlin Plus that you've discussed, and then basically we had that. We had it in the WEU. And the wow. WEU, as you will recall, was not only closed down, but its vital defense clause was absorbed into the Lisbon Treaty, which means that with Brexit, the United Kingdom kingdom is no longer part of it. My question is always, my challenge is always, can we not somehow revive something or reinvent something like this European pillar of NATO, the WEU, the Western European Union that existed, and basically it cannot possibly be to anybody's disadvantage if the Europeans can act more autonomously, if need be. Because one of the things that I think is absolutely clear uh, that's been said over generations of American presidencies is that the Americans would like us to shoulder more of our own defense burden, that they'd like us to be able to do more together. And the other thing that is clear, taking a much, much larger perspective now than the, Europe, uh, than the Ukraine war or even the uh, US departure from Afghanistan, is that simply over the decades since the, uh, the beginning of, of the North Atlantic Treaty and before that, the Western European Union, uh, uh, the United States has gradually declined in its commitment to Europe, or in, in, its, in the, 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 total, the sum total of its commitment to Europe. I'm not saying it'll withdraw. I'm not saying it's going to, it is, there's, the end is in sight. I'm not saying the Americans would not come to our rescue if they can and if the situation is urgent. But what I'm saying is that it is absolutely clear that for a long time, the tilt towards the Indo-Pacific has been a very important factor, which means that it is in everybody's interest, including the United States, that the Europeans can do much more for themselves. And every Everything you've just described, you know, the political will of actually saying, why can't we then in that case get together those member states of both organizations that are in both organizations, and sorry, the others have to stay outside. Uh, you know, why can't we do things together um, is, is absolutely would be in, in the sense of that thing. And, and the, the Western European Union was actually embedded in NATO. It left to NATO everything that it was doing, um, uh, it, it, its organization. That would be a very important answer.
There goes. I've said it before. I mean, it's interesting in the co in the context of what you said, General, that the um, the sort of emphatic lesson to be drawn, I suppose, from Sweden and Finland being members of the EU is that they don't feel safe uh, within solely that structure, that they want NATO membership and that that is the effective response in this crisis from their national perspective. But um, we're going to take two more views on this and then I'm, and then I'm going to try and open things up uh, to the audience. Anna, you wanted to come in quickly. Yeah, I wanted to, 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 to agree to, to a large extent with General Bradshaw. It was a very important statement. When we speak about European pillar of, of NATO, it should be well understood. Of course, the burden uh, sharing, so, so taking much more respo uh, responsibility for, for defending Europe is uh, important. But in terms of decision making, it is slightly, slightly different. And when we speak about transatlantic alliance, uh, well, we have a proof uh, in the war on Ukraine. Actually, it is U.S. in lead, and many countries simply following U.S. or aligning with U.S. and then step by step Europe. I think that there, EU. I think there is much more consolidation and and observing things in the EU. I see that. Uh, this um, um, actually uh, perception of threat from Russia is is much uh, more more common within the EU, and we are able to to better communicate. But it's still much to do, and and U.S., Canada, uh, U.K., also Turkey in many in many ways. Uh, remember Montreux Convention that was uh, quite Invoked, important yeah. on this. So uh, NATO NATO transatlantic link is uh, of vital importance here a and quick, well strategic autonomy. Anna, that a quick is follow up a, from uh, Fabian and then Elizabeth and then. <laughs> we'll open it Sorry. up to one of the questions, no problem. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up um, on, on your comments um, and disagree with you slightly on one of the points. Um, I, I think it's very clear at the moment that the transatlantic relationship is the most important relationship, not only for defense and security, but including that. Um, but I would disagree a bit on the strategic autonomy um, question because um, I think that's uh, misrepresented and maybe the term isn't very um, helpful in that. But really what we're talking about here is addressing the vulnerabilities of Europe. And addressing the vulnerabilities of course also means taking into account where the resources come from, what kind of relationships are behind it. That There's a big difference between a relationship with an ally and with a potential rival or with a potential enemy as, as we have seen now. Um, and then addressing those vulnerabilities. But this is exactly what we should have done years ago when we look, for example, at the energy field. We should have looked at where our energy is coming from and how that makes us vulnerable. And clearly, um, that should have led to action in the area um, of dependence on Russian gas and oil. Um, so I think this is a useful concept to look at. Um, it is also a useful concept because we do have to think in the long term what is the situation going to be? What are the contingencies we have to take? For example, in relation to a different president in the White House, for example, in relation to uh, a possible security guarantee, which has to be given by, e by the EU rather than NATO, um, dependent on what happens between Ukraine, Ukraine and, and, and Russia. So I think there are many issues there which should be addressed. Um, but I think none of that really questions the transatlantic alliance. Quick response from Adrian yeah, and no, then actually, to Elizabeth. Uh, the points you make are entirely fair, and I didn't mean to be too hard on strategic defence autonomy for Europe, but I'm hitting at the use of the term uh, in a political context, particularly from one uh, of, of the member nations, when they seek to um, uh, create more defence autonomy within the EU as opposed to reaching out to uh, NATO and making use of shared structures. 
and I think that is potentially damaging if it suffers to damage the relationship with the United States. Elizabeth. That was the context. No. Um, I think we should, uh, we owe Ukraine a, a big, a huge deal of gratitude for having demonstrated uh, in, in a very unfortunate situation that everybody can play a role in keeping that country safe. So let's learn from, you, uh, from Ukraine, uh, not by waiting for a war. Ukraine didn't wait for a war. They, they didn't have the luxury uh, of, of, uh, of the sort of preparation that we can do. But what we should learn from them is that everybody can play a role in keeping that country safe, in organizing themselves. And if I may, I hope I'm not too Pollyannish, but but isn't the problem in, in our societies that most of us don't feel any sort of allegiance, loyalty to, to uh, our societies uh, or, or to, to civil society, to, to, to societal structures. And that's what we are seeing very dramatically in the US, but also in other countries. And uh, I, I think it started with what uh, Putnam doc Robert Putnam documented 20 years ago, the bowling alone phenomenon. Um, and I'm, as I said, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish about it, but if, if we look at the, the challenges facing our society, uh, especially national security, it stands to reason that we can all get involved in some way. And, and by getting involved, we create that sort of, um, that sort of buffer that, that tells our adversaries that if you try, well, you, you, you can try, but we will have uh, the, the entirety of our society or large parts of our society will be organized and, and will deny you the advantage of, of taking whatever it is you want in our countries. That's what Finland did in 1939 and kept the Russians, the Soviets, at bay for 105 days and, and what the Ukrainians are doing today. Great. Uh, we do have the Ukrainian ambassador here now, so um, uh, the last part of the session is going to be uh, remarks from him. So we've got time for a couple of questions, certainly. Let's see how we go. Uh, so let's, let's start with one or two questions. Um, I think you were just fractionally faster in getting your hand up there. So yeah, let's start there, and then second question here. Uh, yes, thank you, Merrick Chapman. Uh, I'm a macro strategist. I'd, I'd like to ask about the commitment of, um, this is directly at Germany in particular, where we've heard that there's been big changes in their orientation, but it's, it's striking that the 100 billion uh, fund uh, that they've committed to their military is actually extra budgetary. So they're going to continue with the debt break. They're going to pretend that they've not got this fiscal commitment. Um, so it sounds like they're not being entirely honest with themselves. I wonder if you could comment. Well, I think Fabian and General probably should talk to German. Uh, um, I, I think many countries um, play around with uh, budgets and uh, putting things uh, across different years and in different ways. Uh, Personally, I don't think it really matters. What matters is that the money is spent and that it's also spent well. And I think this is one of the, the, the great concerns for me. Uh, the, the number sounds great, but really it isn't only about spending that money. It is about spending that money effectively so that it increases European capability, uh, European capacity, that it contributes better to NATO. And that also means we have to look at the whole defense industrial sector, uh, because in the end, uh, we are already spending a lot of money on defense and security. The question is whether we're doing it effectively. And I would think that uh, if this 100 billion really does have the effect we want to see, uh, then we need to also make changes to how we procure defense and security, how we organize that whole sector. Quickly, well, on. only to say that um, Germany has a, a special contribution to make for the future in that it lies in a particularly significant area of Europe from the point of view of getting stuff from A to B. And it's noteworthy that the means of doing so have been reduced uh, hugely since the days of the Cold War. So for example, where there were dozens of trains that could carry main battle tanks, they are now rather few and tend to be dedicated to commercial interests. So uh, the amount of spending that is required on infrastructural uh, support 
to the means of responding to a threat are enormous. And it's quite possible that uh, defense spending um, in Germany would not be in the shop window if it were going to be very, very uh, effective. I would just make that ob observation. This gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. Major Aaron Broughton, Royal Marines. Uh, my question is to Fusion. Uh, we've spoken a lot about how the UK can cohere its social, political, economic, and military levers. We've seen in the Euro in, in response to the Ukraine crisis an unprecedented, unprecedented response from our civil institutions or civil institutions around the world, such as McDonald's, Visa, IOC. But those institutions have made those decisions unilaterally, whereas in comparison, Russia has a national defense management center which is able to cohere its political, social, economic levers. Now, it has that luxury because clearly it's an autocracy and we're a democracy. In the UK, we're able to do that with, say, counterterrorism, where we have the counterterrorism extremist network. Is it feasible, with us talking about fusion, for us to actually cohere our foreign policy in a way where we could have security lines of effort and, and direction to say something like the BBC, or is that inherently undemocratic? Yeah, Elizabeth first and then Beatrice, yeah. Uh, I'll leave the BBC to Mark. Well, maybe not. Uh, but uh, um, the UK government is actually uh, doing, I hope I'm not revealing anything uh, uh, untoward, but is doing uh, really pioneering work on, on working with the, with the private sector. Uh, because obviously, in, in, as you say, uh, in, a, in a democracy, in a liberal democracy, we, the government can't tell privately owned companies what to do, but it can, it can engage with them to help them better understand their role in, 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 uh, in furthering the national interest. And, and by the way, this is a, a lot harder than it was during the Cold War when companies did that, because CEOs are often from a different country uh, for, than the company, and the company may be ultimately owned in yet another country. But the UK government is is uh, uh, doing some fantastic pioneering work there. Can I uh, address your question in a slightly different way? It's not what you were intended to hear, and it's really, it really should be Professor Helen Thompson who are, uh, comments on this. But one of the things that is happening is that what we're doing, the sanctions, are affecting the entire society. And if we're talking about how um, we're educating the, the, the population to come along with us, it's actually uh, small people who are paying the price of our sanctions. Now, Professor Thompson would be able to enlighten us as to the effect that the sanctions have had on the gas and oil prices and to what extent they were going up even before the war. But I keep getting letters from former friends or old friends who are saying, I can't pay my gas bills in this country. My, my electricity bills in this country. So uh, one of the things that is clearly happening also is that throughout European uh, societies, um, the fact that these prices are going up are something that is seen as challenging the prosperity they've had. And very briefly, therefore, also on Germany, for example, one of the things uh, the Financial Times qu quoted Chancellor Schultz this morning, saying that they had to weigh um, the, the disadvantages of uh, this impeaching or this, this impounding on the, the, uh, the prosperity of our societies against the health for Ukraine. This is one thing that particularly um, Western societies are really not used to any longer, that people have to make sacrifices in that way. And to some extent, one could even say, uh, you know, you uh, turning down the radiator is your tiny contribution to our sanctions on Ukraine. I mean, the, 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 this is not happening. So from that point of view, this, this all of, of, of society approach isn't taking place, although de facto, it's an all of society effort that is being made. To a large extent, it is also about perception of threat. Because uh, we learned something in Poland recently. Three, over three million people coming uh, mm -hmm. through our borders. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of them, actually, it is the biggest wave of refugees, mm -hmm. real F refugees, uh, af after, I Second think, World that World. after the Second yeah. World yeah. War. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not. Uh, it's that is that is true, Let's and with that, without governmental lectures, with full support of government, of course, of all levels of government, but each and individual family, each person took this on uh, his/her own, and they 
uh, host people at home. It is uh, not very easy. I know it from my family experience as well. But they do this. Anna, and let's bring in the other let's two panelists understanding because then we're going to go to the ambassador and who, solidarity who I'm sure will, will reflect on that. But um, let, Fabian and then, and then General Bradshaw. I think this, this question of uh, the cost of living crisis um, is, is really important because it plays much bigger in politics um, than the war itself. Um, maybe that's because it's not communicated in the right way, um, but it does have an influence on how politicians act. Uh, and I think there's also a question of solidarity. How can we actually manage to distribute the costs uh, which are undoubtedly there so that the most vulnerable aren't suffering the most? Because then we're not going to maintain uh, the, the public support for any kind of action uh, in Ukraine. And that also means doing this across countries. Um, there will have to be some form of solidarity between countries because countries are affected very differently. Now, just on Germany, I think uh, what we have seen there is, um, frankly, it's the wrong way of making the argument. Uh, there has been far too much discussion around the economics of it. Uh, the argument in Germany is about historic responsibility, it's about moral responsibility, it is about learning from what happened in the Second World War. That's an argument uh, where Germans can also be convinced that sacrifices are necessary and that there is something here uh, which is more important uh, than the immediate effect. Um, but talking about the economics of it is not going to convince people in Germany. Right, thank you. Uh, thanks. I mean, I think your question was about um, our ability to be able to fuse strategy. Mm. And the, the Ukraine war has served to force us to think about uh, the relationship between economic and um, defense and security and information strategies. Uh, but as yet, our mechanisms for fusing them are not that great which is my point about the EU and NATO working together. In the face of somebody like Putin, who has his hands on most of the levers, you need a very quick response between the military and the diplomatic and the political and the economic if you're going to be effective in response to his latest move, which, which implies in the context of NATO and the EU that they need to be able to work very closely. But within our nations, sadly, we've lost the ability to do that uh, during the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns. They were largely subcontracted out to defense and security. So for example, in the United States, the strategy for the invasion of Iraq, whether you think it was a good thing or a bad thing to do it, the strategy went very rapidly to CENTCOM who did an immaculate job of developing military strategy. But what one needed in Iraq was a holistic strategy. So when we arrived in Iraq, the only people on the ground, by and large, were from defense and the intelligence services. One needed people for reconstruction, for education, for rebuilding political structures, for information. And all of that was missing. Ukraine has forced us to, to confront the, re, re, the reality that all of that needs to be combined. And I think it starts at the top in the Cabinet Office here in UK, in the NSC in, in the United States, which needs to have much more power to bring ministries and departments together and coordinate stuff before it's pushed out. I did want to sort of come back and come back to the question in the sense of saying, well, isn't our NSC system supposed to give us this capability, but I think we are quite limited on time, and I think all of us would very much like to hear from the Ukrainian ambassador. So if I can call on Vadim Pristaiko to come up on stage, and I, and I think his remarks on this topic will obviously be particularly important and interesting to the conference. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear? Thank you. And sorry to get in the way of such an interesting discussion. No, I would no. love to also to be a part of discussion. And mostly what I appreciate when talking to the audience like yours is being able to react, because that's the way how we build up our messaging as well. I understand how many different things here around. And sorry that I came a bit late. I was in another meeting with uh, this audience like yours in the 
in the art museum, where the uh, uh, secretary Ben Wallace was also given his address, and we'll, we'll be happy to see him again. Just a couple of words to, to tell you, uh, actually, I came with the prepared speech, but I understand the appetite here is understand what actually Ukraine, was one of the questions uh, earlier today, what actually Ukraine wants, how Ukraine believes that this war can be ended, and what's actually the end of the war for Ukrainians. I don't want to tell you how the situation on the ground, I have total respect in your media and the people around the government, which are making all the decision, knowing what's actually the situation all about in Ukraine. I just wanted to tell you how Ukrainians see and how we can believe we can bring this uh, to the end. First of all, we had a six uh, rounds of negotiations with Russians. Sometimes very difficult to believe, but we are sitting around the table and negotiating with them. I have to tell you that in usual Russian manner, they came with such a high expectation, such a high uh, sort of demand, that I'm not even going to, to tell you because you will see how unrealistic they are, how unjustified they are, and everybody understood that that's their negotiation position. So what we came at the end of the day to how we managed to bring together us and Russians around what the items. There are just a couple of them. Please bear with me. So the uh, Ukrainians are asking now not how we finish up the war, but how we will be living afterwards. And what is the afterwards security picture? This is something very close to what we're discussing right now. And I'll be more than happy if you engage in this, trying to understand what future of, of our order, if you wish, will be. So the idea came that at the end of the war, we will sign the treaty and ratify by the parliaments, which is very important. I have to remind you that Minsk agreement, so-called, were not a part, and never been signed by anybody, neither by Ukrainian presidents nor Russian, and never been ratified by, by Ukrainian parliament. So there are major guarantors, as we call them guarantors, which we offer it to become Ukrainian's guarantors after the war is ended. And among those, the US, UK, France, China, Turkey, Germany, Canada, Italy, Poland, Israel was mentioned. And in the, in the initial stage, even Russia was mentioned, and Belarus as a guarantors. That was two inputs from Russian side. You can imagine that. So we hope that all the guarantees, uh, guarant guarantors will be able to support our way towards EU. You can see that NATO is not mentioned here. In the next 15 years, we agreed with Russians that the fate of Crimea will be decided. This is a very interesting diplomatic way of you know, telling that we don't know what to do with, with Crimea right now. The fate of Lugansk and Donetsk, so-called Lugansk and Donetsk People Republics, is also set aside and given to the presidents, President Putin and President Zelensky, to decide when they meet. It's again very, very, uh, as a purely diplomatic trick, how to allow the negations progress, knowing that the stumbling block is here. The sanctions and legal actions against Russia should be discussed only when we finish the peace treaty with Russians. Not before, as some of our colleagues in Europe now are alluding, telling the Russians, you know what, do something, we will start lifting the sanctions. And the last one, that everything we discuss with Russia will go on a referendum with Ukrainians. If Ukrainians decide that we have, still have to go to find the place under the umbrella of NATO security, security guarantees, so the Russian-Ukrainian negotiations will be restarted. That's more or less, I understand, it's complex, that that's more or less what we agreed. The last official negotiations were on the 29th of March. Obviously, Russians are not happy with the result of negotiations, and they believe that they don't have to go along them. They will fight and they will achieve something on the ground. On our side, the same. We start to receive more support, sometimes militarily support, sometimes politically, sometimes financially, and both negotiation teams and their positions departed each other. So just to finish that, if we will have one minute I will, and somebody will have questions on this structure, I will be happy to respond. But just a couple of things to, to tell what, what, what Ukraine, Ukrainians feel, what is our biggest pain right now. This is the lack of security structures which would allow us as a nation to survive. We are not talking about Budapest Memorandum. Everybody knows the fate of Budapest Memorandum. We are not talking about the Peace, partnership for peace with NATO did work with us. The NATO on our border did not help us either. The European uh, sort of future is not, is not helping. So the Helsinki final act, we have to admit that Russians just, just threw this paper away. 
OSCE did not work. In Ukraine, it was the biggest and most expensive mission OSCE over the whole existence of, existence of organization. Didn't work either. Don't, don't, I don't want to just to start with the UN and UN Security Council. So what Ukrainians, maybe we are you know, too hasty in our, in our observations and our assessment of the existing structures in the world, but that's what the nations have when they when, had, has when it is at war against the very big, powerful nation with a nuclear weapon and a part of the uh, uh, <clears throat> Security Council. So what Ukrainians believe can be done right now? We offer it, maybe it's half-baked, I understand, but we offer it an idea to the world, and we call it United 24, meaning that we offer an idea that will become a sort of basis for the new security arrangement. I'm not talking about organization, but arrangement. Ukraine asks that if anything happens to the sovereign state in the world, the nation's guarantors of this security will come together in the three days we'll finish up all the consultations, just three days. Then the next move is nations guaranteeing that the sky over the particular nation will be closed against any enemy on this planet. Third, the nation in need will be provided all the assistance they re require, militarily, financial, and everything. I know that it sounds like a fiction, but that's the best we could come at the moment right now. Let me stop it here. If we have a second, I will be more than happy to reply. If not, thank you very much. We do just have time for one or two questions. So let's, uh, the, the first hand I saw there, uh, obviously we have got the ambassador, so questions to the ambassador or the panel, but let's say, uh, yeah. Any ter uh, the, you were talking about the terms of a settlement. There are three issues I think are very, very important for many Ukrainians, uh, uh, which ought to be, or perhaps I'd like your views, whether they are a condition of a settlement or a condition of sanctions being lifted. Uh, war crimes, in other words, the pursuit of war criminals at the height of the Russian leadership down to the troop level of Russian forces, that's point number one. Uh, the issue of reparations, for war damage inflicted by the Russian aggression on Ukraine. And thirdly, the very uh, humanitarian issue of, of the deportees, not the refugees who fled to Western Europe, but the compulsory deportees from the occupied territories who have been deported into Russian territory and are being currently re-educated, as it were. Those three issues, are they part of the, your, your conditions for sanctions being lifted? In other words, that has to be resolved before some sort of semblance of normality returns to relations with Russia. Thank you. Uh, what I gave you, this is official party line, if I may. If you talk to a hardliner like myself, I will tell you that, for example, I can't see why we have to look into pockets of Western taxpayers' money for the after-war reconstruction and rebuild. I believe Russia has to pay to, for everything. So everything you mentioned, it's not even a question. That's, that's the way I would describe. I can't see how can we get out with reparations not to be paid by Russians, or all, the, all those committed uh, the uh, crimes won't be uh, prosecuted. And there are so many other things. I guess the best way out of it if Ukraine wins militarily. So if you allow yourself, it's very difficult to believe, I understand. But if you allow it's, itself, the, the idea that actually Russia can be defeated on the, on the field of, of war, you would allow yourself to think and find the way how to do it, what to do. Maybe it will be even better for Russians themselves. A quick question from Fabian. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, because you mentioned EU membership, and I wanted to ask, what is the expectation uh, of Ukraine in terms of EU membership and also timescales? It's very easy. We uh, believe that uh, that's actually what initiated the war. What, what was the last drop when Russians lost their, their patience? Remember, in 2013, that was the case why they went against us and that, why they went to take over the Crimea. So it's not even NATO that's uh, that much, because uh, in this audience, I don't have to explain that NATO is already all over Russian Western border. It's just another piece is not changing the strategic, strategic concept of, of Russia being able to defend itself. So this is EU. We are just departing. Ukraine showed that they were not ideal, but we're departing somewhere, thus creating the 
conflict within Russian society, creating this threat to Russian society that somebody like Ukrainians can live differently. They don't need Russia you know, to follow the case. We can build up very, very our Slavic, finally Slavic Orthodox nation can live Western way. This will be blow not to Russia, not to Russian population, not to huge Russian territory, but the way they run themselves, Russian, Russian dictatorship, whatever the way it is. System of power. Um, look, uh, we are pretty much out of time, so please join me in thanking very much Ambassador Pistar. UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace on stage shortly. There will be a little bit of a hiatus. So I will ask the panel to join me in leaving the stage, but please also let's thank our panel for today. <laughs>